So I'm, it, it's a mini course, right? So I've got these uh, three lectures planned, and it appears we have plenty of time. So I'm, I'm not used to, to giving uh, sort of the, the long, long lecture format. I, I'm hoping we'll take a, a break maybe at some point. And so I've got an outline here, and uh, yes, maybe after that bad proof technique, we'll, we'll take a break. So. But uh, since we have so much time, and, it, and it's a mini course, I'm really hoping that people will interrupt me. Please, at any moment, if I'm saying something that seems unclear, I'm very happy to stop and go back. We can use this thing to So, uh, what am I here to talk about? I'm a combinatorialist. You know, at the end of the day, what I really like to do is count things, come up with formulas that, that count things. I know this is a very pedestrian sort of a goal, but in the process of finding such formulas, every once in a while we run across something strange and interesting, and it, you know, we, we look for reasons why it's true, and sometimes it's true for, for interesting reasons. And this is what I'm going to tell you about. I'm, I'm actually going to start out with just a purely combinatorial phenomenon, which in the process of trying to find good explanations, it uh, made us consider reflection group theory, real reflection group theory, complex reflection group theory, and then eventually there were instances where we really <coughs> had to think about modular invariant theory and GLNFQ, the finite linear groups over, general linear groups over a finite field, and we needed modular characteristic P analogs of some results from invariant theory in order to pursue this line of inquiry. But at the same time, there are many instances of this phenomenon that I'm going to talk about, that I'll start with, which we know that they're true, but for bad reasons. So uh, uh, we, we can check it, but we don't have a good, insightful proof. And so I'm really happy to be talking here at a place where we have topologists and Lee theorists, because Lee theory and, and uh, group theory definitely has been a source of some of the ideas that we're missing to really understand this well. And so I'm hoping that more good proofs will come from the examples that I tell you we don't understand well. And maybe some of you in a month or two months or a year will walk up to me and say, ah, I have a good reason for why that happens. I'm happy to, to tell you about it here. OK, so this points, this advances. Yes, this advances. OK, so I'm going to be talking about Q analogs first. This is definitely a, a beloved combinatorial thing, a tradition to find Q analogs of finite combinatorial objects. And this phenomenon that I'm talking about is this cyclic sitting phenomenon. It's some kind of enumerative thing. I'll explain what I mean. It shows up all over the place. Many of the places where we know that it holds, we have what I'm calling in quotes a bad proof. It's not so bad. And uh, the technique is widely applicable, but it's you know, you'll, you'll consider it kind of demeaning and pedestrian when I show it to you. Uh, what we really want usually are good proofs, and I'll explain what I mean by good proof. You know, it means enlightening, some real reason why, why things are happening. And so, uh, in the in the process, now, after I tell you about the good proofs, what I'm going to tell you about is an analog for the finite general linear group of one of our first examples, our favorite example. We almost immediately saw, ooh, it has an analog. We, we should think about it as a symmetric group thing, but it has an analog for the general linear group. And so I'll tell you about that. And then in the, the second lecture, we'll see how invariant theory and uh, modular invariant theory is, was where we were led. OK, so what's, what's happening? Can you read this? I'm a little bit worried that it's illegible. Oh, this is bad. <laughs> OK, I'm going to have to read it for you. <laughs> or you're going to have to sit closer. <laughs> cool. So what is a Q analog? That's, that's what it's said. And uh, so here it is. It's combinatorial. So I'm going to have a finite set. I'll always call that set x. And its cardinality, I'm calling you know, absolute value of x, the, the size of x. That's what these, these bars around x mean. And my definition, this is not some standard thing to say, what is a Q analog? But a Q analog for this cardinality of x is a polynomial. x of q is what I'm going to call it. It's 
In all my examples, it's going to be a polynomial with integer coefficients in the variable q. And uh, yes, there's even going to be an instance where all I know is that it's actually a rational function in q. But in, in most of the examples, it'll be a polynomial in q with integer coefficients. And that at a minimum, if I'm going to call it a q analog for the cardinality of x, I want that this polynomial in q, when I set q equal to 1, I want it to give me back the cardinality of the set x. Okay, so it's a q analog for the cardinality of x. And hopefully, it's going to have at least one of these other pleasant uh, properties uh, that I'm listing on the, on the next page. So uh, by the way, please don't take notes. I, these uh, slides are all uh, linked from my own uh, homepage on the web. If you go to talks, you'll find this, these talks. So these things are all there. And so what other properties would I want? Uh, OK, a whole bunch. Gosh, we'll be able to read any of those. So, some uh, pleasant properties. One that's very common in the, in the combinatorics world is that the Q analog for the set X is really a generating function for some statistic on the set X. So S is just supposed to be a statistic. It takes elements of the set X and you know assigns them a zero, a one, a two, some value. And I make those the exponents of the power of Q. And my Q analog x of Q is just the sum over the elements, little x in capital X, of Q to the statistic. So it's a generating function for the set x by the statistic little x. Right. Obviously, this will have the property that when I set Q equal to 1, I get back the cardinality of x. All of the terms in the sum become 1s, and so I'm summing over the uh, many elements of x, and I get the cardinality of x. Right, so here's some other pleasant <coughs> properties that happen in many examples. My x of q has a simple product formula. We'll, we'll see several of these. So this is uh, very helpful. It's, it's very helpful for doing the bad proofs. We're lucky that many of them have product formulas. So my bad technique is, is going to work. Here's one that's quite common. That the q has meaning for a prime power. So the, the cardinality of a finite field. So when q is equal to p to the d for a prime p, so it's a prime power, then x of q at that value counts the points of some variety. Uh, and I'm calling it here x of fq. No, you the fq points of some variety. And uh, it, it's counting that. So we'll see some, several examples like this. Uh, maybe not several, some examples like this. Uh, here's another one that's common. Hilbert series, that x of q is the Hilbert series for some graded ring R. So R is supposed to be a graded algebra over some field K, so R has, is a direct sum of homogeneous components, R sub i, R sub 0 plus R plus 1 plus R sub 2. Usually R sub 0 is just the field K, connected graded algebra. And by Hilbert series for a graded algebra R, I just mean the generating function which keeps track of the dimensions of the field K of the graded pieces R sub R. So it's this, uh, you, and most often these, these graded algebras that I'll be considering will have only finitely many non-zero uh, homogeneous components. So that this generating function, this Hilbert series, ends up being a polynomial okay, with non-negative coefficients because the coefficients are the dimensions of the gradient. Okay, so that when I say Hilbert series, that's what I mean here. <clears throat> okay, here's another property that some examples will have. When I take x at q squared, so I double the, the degrees in my polynomial q, many of these examples have the property that uh, I am getting the, the Poincaré polynomial for some interesting complex variety. So the the complex points of x, x of c. And uh, by Poincaré polynomial, I just mean that you're counting the Betty numbers of this uh, mm -hmm. complex variety. Many times they're, so they should only have even dimensional homology or cohomology. Many times they don't even have any torsion in some of these, these nice examples. And so this Betty number, you could think of as the rank of these integral homology groups, or you could take your coefficients over a field. To, in many of the examples, it won't matter. So often, this is another bit of meaning. And 
I'm not just saying that these things are desirable because uh, I like them. Some of them have actually been used, some of these interpretations, to prove instances of this phenomenon that we're going to talk about. And here's one more. So x of q squared, instead of being uh, the uh, Poincaré polynomial for a complex variety, sometimes you know, up to a, a, a power, an overall power scaling by q to the capital N, we're getting the formal character of an SL2C representation. So uh, SL2C, so this is two by two invertible complex matrices, and uh, its representations, finite dimensional representations, are completely reducible. And we know everything about them, essentially, if we know what their formal character is. So the formal character is we look at these elements. Yes, I can do that. It's a diagonal element, an element of the, the uh, maximal torus that has q and q inverse as its eigenvalues. Sorry. What happens if you have a subset? A subset of x? Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, in general, I won't get the same phenomenon for one of these subsets, but I haven't even described the, the phenomenon. Yet. Sorry, maybe I didn't understand the funny question. I mean, if I, a subset is a set, so I could make the x of q for the subset. Uh, in the first case, yes, I could certainly sum the statistic, but I might not have, for example, a sub-representation. Or I might not have a sub variety. So it doesn't induce? No, not necessarily. Okay. Not in general. Okay. Yeah, so the, this last situation is uh, the formal character of an SL2C representation. I look at the diagonal elements, they're parameterized by Q, one of the eigenvalues, Q or Q inverse, and you're just asking what is the, uh, uh, yes, what am I asking for? The, the weight space. Decomposition. So the dimensions of the i weight space, so the, the weight space V sub i is where this element in SL2C acts by q to the i. So that's the i weight space. And I'm just looking at the generating function for the i weight spaces with the q to the i stuck in front formally. So that's what I mean by a formal character. And many of these examples, that's that's what x of q will mean when I change q to q squared and shift by i. <coughs> okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm dragging this out. Let me give you the proto example which has all of these properties. So this is the very, very first one that we encountered in some sense. So my set X is going to be all of the K element subsets of 1 through N. And uh, I need a Q analog of the cardinality of all K element subsets of 1 through N. Well, how many K element subsets of 1 through N are there? N choose K? I need some Q analog of N choose K. There is one that everybody loves in combinatorics. It's called the q-binomial coefficient instead of the binomial coefficient. And uh, OK, so how hopeless is it now to, to read these things? Uh, can people, as I'm saying it, can you, can you read these? OK. <coughs> so it's going to be n factorial sub q divided by k factorial sub q and n minus k factorial sub q on the bottom. So it's like the binomial coefficient, n factorial divided by k factorial. I suggest maybe you should go out of the full screen view and just talk. Maybe. Magnify. That's a great suggestion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm all like that. Yeah. So what if we, we drag this window? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I'll have to go down the slide. Okay. So let's try that again. X is K element subsets of 1 through N. Here's my analog of its cardinality, N choose K, but now it's N choose K sub Q. There's a subscript Q there. It's a Q binomial coefficient. My factorials change into these things that are Q factorials. I put the square brackets and the exclamation point in the sub Q. And how do I define m factorial sub q? It's m sub q times m <coughs> minus 1 sub q, dot, 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 2 sub q, 1 sub q, where, what's this m sub q? It's a q analog of the number m. So it is, can you see what that could happen? Oh, that's not the hand. Point. I thought <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so this uh, m sub q is just this geometric series with m terms 1 plus q plus q squared up to q to the m minus 1. 
it's okay, it's this geometric series. It, when Q goes to one, this Q analog of M certainly goes to M. That means the Q analog of M factorial certainly goes to M factorial. And so this thing, when Q equals one, will certainly go to N choose K, which is the cardinality of X. Okay, pass my first test. And now, that's my, my Q analog. And this has all of the, the pleasant properties that I'm talking about. Can we get them all on screen? Let's see if we can get many of them on screen. So first of all, it is actually the generating function for K element subsets of 1 through N by some reasonable statistic. Forget about this minus K minus 1 choose 2. That's just a shift, a Q power shift. The statistic is you sum the entries of a set. It's a subset of the numbers one through n, because so I can add up the entries in all. The set two, five, seven, I would say two plus five plus seven is the, this, this statistic. So it'd be uh, 14 would be the statistic value. And it, I'm not going to prove it for you, but that's not too hard to check that this thing actually has this interpretation as a natural statistic, the generating function for natural statistic on sets. It also has this property that you're counting the points in some variety x of fq. So the fq value points for the Grassmannian of k planes in uh, n-dimensional space over fq. So I'll write k planes in fq to the n. Okay? I'm not going to prove this for you, but this is sort of a standard exercise in enumerative combinatorics books. One of my favorites is written by my advisor, Enumerative Combinatorics, Volume 1, Richard Stanley. I, I don't get paid by him if I don't mention his books. <laughs> <laughs> so you can, you can find proofs of these things, but they're not very hard. I can, there are Q Pascal recurrences for the Q binomial coefficient, like the Pascal recurrence, and you can check that this satisfies that recurrence, you can check that this satisfies that recurrence. And so these are kind of not very hard combinatorial exercises. Okay. It has, uh, so it counts points in a variety over FQ. It is also the Poincaré polynomial for some complex varieties. So it's basically the same variety. It takes a complex points, the, the Grassmannian of K planes in C to the N. And yes, that's a situation where because of, I don't know, Schubert cell decomposition, there are only even dimensional cells in a certain cell decomposition. So it only has integer homology, only in even dimensions. There is no torsion. Uh, yes, uh, what do I want to say? Right. And so we should form the, the generating function for its even Betty numbers. And that will be this Q binomial coefficient when Q is replaced by Q squared. Okay. And it is also the formal character of an SL2C representation, a very natural one. Uh, SL2C, yes, which, uh, oh, yeah, you know, I forgot to say what the representation was of, of the SL2C acting on um, uh, C to the N. Yes, I'm, so I'm, I'm hiding from you a little bit of information to understand this interpretation. So there's a principal SL2C. Uh, you take principal nil pub element and you can form a, a copy of, uh, uh, I'm doing what the L2. Pardon me, but I'm going to suppress it. There's, a, there's an action of SL2C on C to the N, and when we take its k-fold exterior power, the formal character is going to be up to a shift by some power of Q, exactly this N choose K or Q squared. And yeah, so I guess what I should say is that when the SL2C is acting on n-dimensional space, it essentially has the N sub Q as its formal character up to a shift sort of make your n sub q have symmetric powers. It's going to go from q to the negative n to q to the positive n, summed as a geometric series. And then when you take the k exterior power of that representation, you get this as the formal s l 2 let's, let's not worry about it, but it's, it's not a hard calculation. And there's this graded algebra interpretation. This is, in fact, going to be probably the most important interpretation of all from, from the point of view of what I'm doing. And choose case of Q is the Hilbert series of this ring. What is this ring? Well, I begin with a polynomial algebra in n variables. Okay? A polynomial algebra in n variables 
as an action of the symmetric group SM permuting the variables. We're going to be coming back to this. This is invariant theory starting to creep in. I take the invariant polynomials. We understand those the polynomials in elementary symmetric functions or various other symmetric functions. We take the polynomials which are only invariant under this subgroup, SK across SN minus K, so in which you're permitting only the first K variables separately from the last N minus K variables. We understand that ring reasonably well, too. We take this ring modulo of the, the, uh, the invariant polynomials of positive degree. That's what this plus means. I'll, I'll be coming back to this. this is, don't, don't worry if this is, seems a little mysterious. The point is, there's some reasonably natural graded ring here. It's actually the cohomology ring of this Grassmannian. It, uh, it has other interpretations. And its Hilbert series in Q, where each variable is given degree 1, is the n shoots k. Is it Q? Okay. Yes? Is there some class of varieties, complex varieties, that have this property that, that when you that the Betty numbers count the number of points over FQ? Well, so there's the conditions like having an affine paving is, is a sufficient condition for this. Um, I don't know, you know, sort of more broad. Just something like that happens for hyperfine relations too. Right, and so then you get into these issues like, you know, the Bay conjectures and, uh, and so, like Rotten Bay questions. I mean, you need, you need good things to happen, you know, things about stuff that I don't so know about. There's no easy answer. There's no easy answer. <laughs> I've actually seen uh, people saying like varieties with is it point counts. There, there is a name for this condition that I've seen in the literature. I can try to put that up. Okay. All right, so what is this phenomenon? I'm talking about this cyclic sitting phenomenon. So I want to have a cyclic action on my finite group, and I want that X of Q to be telling me about the cyclic action, hiding some information for me. So uh, a cyclic sitting phenomenon, or CSP, is when our set X has uh, some natural cyclic group acting on it. So capital C is going to be my cyclic group. I'll usually write uh, angle brackets, you know, little c, to say that C is generated by little c. I'm just picking a generator for the cyclic group. And let's say the size of my cyclic group is n, so it's isomorphic to z mod n z, integers mod n under addition. And so the powers of c, you know, to the n minus first power, and e is the identity is the zeroth power, that's my cyclic group. And I'm going to say that I have a cyclic sieving phenomenon if. I'll say that the set X is Q analog in the cyclic action exhibits a cyclic sitting phenomenon. <clears throat> if, when I want to count how many points are fixed by some element in the cyclic group, so C to the D, D was any integer. It's just typical element in the cyclic group. I want to know how many points of X it fixes, and I'll write this, the cardinality of X super C to the D. When I write superscripts for group elements, it means the fixed points. How many of them are there? It's hiding in my polynomial. All I do is I plug in a root of unity, zeta to the d, where zeta is a primitive nth root of unity, and then zeta to the d is just, you know, it's d to the power, it's some other root of unity, that has the same multiplicative order as that cyclic group element, c to the d. So that's, that's the, the phenomenon. Where this x of q, it wasn't just hiding at q equals 1, right? That's the zeroth power of your say that. It's not just that q equals 1 was counting something, but every one of these nth roots of unity is actually counting something and telling us about the cyclic action. It's really telling us everything about the cyclic action. So I'm not sure I don't have anything going on below. So Our first example looked like this. And so this was work that uh, my two colleagues in Minnesota, Dennis Stanton and Dennis White, the Dennises would like to call them, uh, 
back in 2004, we, we wrote a paper called The Cyclic Setting Phenomenon, and this was our first example, and it, it was, you've got the subsets of 1 through n, I've got my Q analog, is the Q binomial coefficient, and what cyclic group C am I going to take? Actually, there's two different choices. I'm, I'm going to tell you about both of them in parallel. Either I take an n cycle in the symmetric group Sn, so it sends 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, dot, 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 and n goes to 1. So you're cycling the, the 1 through n mod n, in the generator of your group. Or actually you could cycle 1 through n minus 1, so an n minus 1 cycle, and just fix the n. So my generator might just send the 1 through n minus 1 around and leave the n alone. This acts on the subsets. When I have subsets, I just take it to, you know, like 2, 5, 7 goes to 3, 6, 8. And if n was equal to 8, it would go to 3, 6, 1, which is the same as 1, 3, 6. These are unordered <coughs> subsets. Okay? And the claim is that this always exhibits a cyclic setting. So I'm going to get the number of fixed subsets when I plug in roots of unity in that q binomial. Let's see an example. n equals 4, k equals 2. Okay, so two element subsets of 1, 2, 3, 4. There's only six of them. I need to keep this, this q binomial coefficient. Now, we already encounter one of the, the weird things here. If you've never seen q binomial coefficients before, it looks like it's a rational function, right? It's a polynomial. <coughs> This is the Q analog of 4, this is the Q analog of 3, this is the Q analog of 2, the Q analog of 1. You know, you cancel these things similarly to binomial coefficients. So I'm left with a 4 times a 3 over a 2 times a 1. But why do these polynomials cancel? Well, until we have some other interpretations or these Q Pascal recursions, it wouldn't have been clear that it actually turns out to be polynomial. But it is, always. It's that, you know. It's Remember, this is a generating function for some statistic on the set x, so we knew it would be non-negative coefficients of polynomial. Okay, so here's this polynomial. 1 plus q plus 2q squared plus q cubed plus q to the fourth. Looks strange, but it actually is telling us about these two orbit structures. So here's my cyclic group of order 4. Remember, n is 4 here, so I should either consider this z mod 4z or and is the n minus 1 cycle fixing the 4. So this says 1 goes to 2, goes to 3, goes to 1, and 4 is fixed over here. And in this 4 cycle picture, I don't know if you can see this orbit structure, 1, 2 goes to 2, 3, goes to 3, 4, goes to 1, 4, right? And then 1, 4 goes back to uh, 2, 1, but that's the same as 1, 2 because these are unordered sets. So I get a, a four cycle, a free orbit, right? An orbit in which the stabilizer is uh, trivial for any non-identity element. And here's a non-free orbit in which one three goes to two four, and then two four goes back to three one, which is one three. Right? So there's some mildly interesting orbit structure here that I wouldn't a priori have been able to tell you instantaneously. What does it look like? How many free orbits? How many orbits with this stabilizer? But it's hidden in that polynomial. Over here, I actually have two free orbits. One two goes to two three goes to one three goes to one two, and one four goes to two four goes to three four goes to one four. Right, the four is just being fixed. Here, four is fixed every time, so that's why we get this three cycle. Everybody understand the, the orbit structure, and the claim is that polynomial is hiding the information. So how is that? Remember, it's this polynomial up here, this thing. When I evaluate it at either fourth roots of unity on this side, so here, I'm, let zeta be a primitive fourth root of unity, i, complex number i, the imaginary number. Uh, when I raise it to the zero, or when I square it, or when I raise it to the first, or to the third, actually, it's not going to matter. This should be telling me how many elements are fixed under that power of the, the cyclic generator. Well, I'm not surprised that when I raise it to the zero, that's q equals one. I said this was a q analog, so it should be that one plus q plus two q squared plus q q plus q to the fourth. When I add up the coefficients, one plus one plus two plus one plus one, I should get the size of my set back. We saw. Sorry? It says four, but it should say six, right? 
It should. Well, well, sorry about two that. Plus one plus one. Thank you. Yep, that's supposed to be a four choose two. That's a six. Sorry. Can't correct it. Yes. Typo. Okay. Slightly more interesting. What about when I plug in zeta squared, i squared, which is negative one, right? So that's my cyclic element of order two. So uh, when I do c squared, when I go twice around, these two elements are fixed. This one and this one, these elements are not. They go halfway around their orbit. And so I should be getting a two when I plug in q equals negative one, and I do. I get uh, what? One minus one plus two minus one plus one is two. And then here, when I plug in either q is uh, zeta to the first, so i to the first, or i q, the same thing will happen, but I just did the i to the first. When I plug in q equals i, I get 1 plus i minus 2 minus i plus 1 is 0. It all cancels out. And indeed, that's the number of elements that are fixed by a single action of c to the first. Right? Nobody's fixed by c to the first. There's no fixed points under this c, to the c action. So no orbits, zero counting here. Everybody OK? But this is a good time for a question. OK. I'll be doing a couple more of these, but I'll do, do them a little bit faster. Here, uh, everything's a free orbit. So what happens? When I stick in uh, q equals zeta to the 0, now zeta sorry, is e to the 2 pi i over 3, the appropriate primitive third unit, third root unit. Any third root of primitive third root will work. I'm just picking 1 to the, to the uh, 2 pi i over 3. And when I plug that in here, uh, q equals 1, so zeta to the, first, zeta to the 0, which is, is 1. Of course, again, I've made the same mistake twice. My, that 4 is also a 6. <laughs> Sorry about that. And here, if I plug in either q is zeta the first or zeta squared, so the primitive cube roots of unity, you can check. Like 1 plus q plus q squared is 0. So I can take out a 1 the plus q plus q squared. I'll be left with a q squared plus q cubed plus q to the fourth. That's also 0 when I plug in the cube root of unity. So I get a 0 plus 0, I get a 0. And the point is, again, there is nobody that's fixed under the first power of C. No one is just a fixed point for the static action. So it, it properly was telling us about the, the number of fixed points. And you might say, why am I focused on, on fixed points? Well, really, this is telling you everything about the, the orbit structure in the cyclic action. You can just tell me about how many fixed points there are for the various cyclic group elements. One way to think about it is, you're saying that the polynomial x of q is hiding the character values for the cyclic group, the complex character values, at its evaluations at roots of unity. Right? When you look at the, the very, it's a permutation representation of the cyclic group. So that means, what's the character value for a little c to the d, a group element? You count how many things are fixed. It's the trace of its permutation matrix. So it's just how many things does it fix? So these are the character values that we're getting when we plug in the zetas. Okay, and maybe you don't like representation theory that the cyclic group action is completely determined by its character values, but it's also telling you in, in a simple way the orbit structure. There's a, another way to phrase it. Here's, this is equivalent. I could have said this triple is exhibiting a, a cyclic sieving, sieving phenomenon, x, x of q in the to c action, if when I take the x of q and reduce it mod q to the n minus 1, right, it would make sense that it only did these values that I plug in, these zetas, or zeta squared or zeta cubed, since they're all nth roots of unity, it should only depend on this polynomial up to you know, taking out q to the n minus 1 factors. So when I reduce it mod q to the n minus 1 down to something that only has uh, q to the 0, q to the first, q squared up to q to the n minus 1, there's some coefficients in front, some unique coefficients that I can express it that way. A0, A1, A2. And what the AI is, is really how many of the C orbits on X 
have their stabilizer or isotropy subgroup, the subgroup that fixes a particular element, of size dividing i. Okay, maybe that seems a little weird. Why didn't I say size i, but no, it's size dividing i. You can get the number that have size i by doing an inversion. However, let me, uh, let me just point out, because it'll, we'll see it in some of these examples, I will be reducing some of these mod q to the n minus 1. And that means that a0 should just be the total number of orbits. Right? Every orbit has its uh, isotropy subgroup of some size. Everything divides 0. Right? Every number divides 0. Right? You multiply 0 times. So this, this constant term, after you reduce it mod q to the n minus 1, that should be the total number of orbits. And for example, a1, the power on q to the first, that should be the number of orbits where the uh, stabilizer subgroup divides 1, which means it has to be of size 1, which means it's just the identity. Those are free orbits. Stabilizer subgroups are all trivial. That means you're free. So this next coefficient, the coefficient in front of q to the first, that's telling you about the free orbits. So, in many of these examples, let's, say, well, let's look at the A0 and the A1 and see that you know, it's, it's doing the right thing. It's just another way to, to think about the phenomenon. And all of those coefficients together are recovering for you the orbits, how many orbits have a given isotropy subgroup size, which means how many orbits are there of a given size. If I tell you the size of the isotropy subgroup in one of these cyclic orbits, you divide by the size of the cyclic group to get the size of the orbit. All the information is there. It's just encoded slightly differently when you reduce it mod q to the n minus 1 rather than plugging in the words of unity. So, okay. So, in this example, let me just illustrate this with uh, reducing. Okay, so I had that same q analog. 1 plus q plus 2q squared plus qq plus q to the fourth. If I reduce it mod q to the fourth minus 1, these are the coefficients that show up. I get 2 plus 1 times q to the first plus 2 times q squared plus 1 times q cubed. And then it stops. So I'm working mod q to the fourth minus 1. And this is easy. You just you take your coefficients in front of higher powers of q and you just reduce the coefficient mod n and add it to one of these earlier coefficients easy calculations to do. And so what happens when I do it? Oh, so it, it looks like this, mod q to the fourth minus one, two, one, two, one are the coefficients. Whereas mod q cubed minus one, it looks like two, two, two are the coefficients. A zero, A one, A two. Different story. And this is, you know, let's just check that it's consistent with what we were saying about orbits, total number of orbits and number of free orbits. On this side, this A zero is two, yep two orbits. Right? I said A0 should be the number of orbits. There's two of them. One of them is a free orbit. One of them has a stabilizer subgroup of size 2. And uh, so the A1, right there, that 1, saying it should have been one free orbit, yes, it's, this one is being counted by that. Okay. And you might say, oh, well, why is the A2 equal to 2? So let's think about that. A2 was supposed to be the number of orbits where the isotropy subgroup has size dividing 2. In this case, the isotropy subgroup is of size 1. Here it's of size 2. They both divide 2. So there should have been two orbits counted in that coefficient. Okay. And similarly over here, this is what happens when you have a, a free action. All the coefficients are actually constant when you do this reduction. You get a0 is equal to a1 is equal to 2. All the orbits are free. Two orbits total because a0 is 2. And two free orbits because a1 is also equal to 2. And the stabilizer sizes divide every coefficient. So every coefficient is just counting up how many orbits. So the free orbit situation is all free orbits is kind of boring. All right, so that's our first example of the phenomenon. Everything good is happening. We understand this one really, really well. We have bad proofs, good proofs, better proofs, best proofs now. We don't have best proofs, so it doesn't exist. So any questions so far? How, how are we doing? Yes, sir. What happens if you uh, 
say how Z2 actually fixing the mass too. Oh, it fails. Great question. Yeah, why didn't I continue this and say my cyclic group could have been an n cycle, could have been an n minus one cycle, why couldn't it have been like an n minus two cycle <coughs> fixing the last two, or, or, or maybe even switching the last two? Fails. I didn't do it for you, but it fails, and we're going to see why. So this is in the bad proofs. It's not clear why this is happening. You can check it that it fails. In the good proofs. You actually see why n cycles and n minus 1 cycles in the symmetric group are special. They are regular elements in the sense of Schringer. They are the type A regular elements. It's powers of n cycles and powers of n minus 1 cycles. Okay? All right. Now let me tell you about the ones where I'm hoping that in a month, a week, tomorrow, a year, you're going to give me a better proof. These, I'm going to give you a couple examples that they look cool, we can check them, but we only have bad proofs. So in some sense, we don't understand them, and we're, we're looking for more enlightening proofs. Here's one. Um, this is a frustrating but important example. This one is going to generalize, actually, to cluster algorithm, clusters, but we don't understand why. And we already don't even understand this non-generalized version. It was in our original paper. My set X is going to be triangulations of an N plus 2 gon. I'll draw you some pictures below. And some of you may know that when you count the triangulations of a, you know, a polygon, there's some Catalan numbers that count it. Okay. So it turns out for an N plus 2 gon, it's uh, this Catalan number, the, the Q Catalan, uh, sorry, the Catalan number 1 over N plus 1, 2 N choose N. You count the triangulations. I need to Q count them. So I need a Q analog. I just take my you know, 1 over Q analog of n plus 1, and my 2n shoes n sub q. It sounds ridiculous, but you might even ask, is this thing a rational function? We knew that the, the q binomial coefficients, 2n shoes n, is polynomial. But what about when I divide it by another polynomial? Yeah, it turns out it's a polynomial still. And yeah, it turns out it actually has non-negative coefficients. Not obvious. Not obvious at all. You need statistics or some, something more insightful that I'll show you later as to why that's non -negative. it has non-negative coefficients in its polynomial in Q. What's my cyclic group acting? Well, I'm going to have triangulations of a polygon. I'm going to rotate my polygon. I'm going to number its vertices and cycle the, the vertex labels. So it's going to be a cyclic group of order n plus 2 because it's an n plus 2 gon. And it's going to be generated by rotations through an angle of 2 pi over n plus 2. And we claim this always gives us such a CSP triple. How's this going on? Let's see, n equals 6. OK, I think we got it all there. Here's the orbits. There's a free orbit. Those triangulations. There's a, an orbit of size 3. Notice, these two orbits, they look similar as triangulations. You know, They sort of have an N shaped, a zigzag in the middle with the diagonals. But they're only dihedrally equivalent. They're not cyclically equivalent up to rotation. I'm really only talking about the cyclic action here. So these two are in separate orbits. Uh, and here's an orbit of size 2. Okay, So we've got some interesting you know, isotropy subgroups, interesting catalog of, of orbit sizes. And here it is. I'm supposed to take, because n equals 6, uh, I'm supposed to take uh, 1 over n plus 1. Uh, no. Another mistake, n plus 2 gone. So n equals 4. Pardon me. The 6 is the size of the polygon. The n here is really 4. I'm sorry about this n versus n plus 2 shift, but that's another typo. I should say n equals 4, so it's the 6. Anyway, it's supposed to take 1 over n plus 1, 2n, choose n. So 2 times 4, choose 4, sub q. And I would have gotten, you know, for this Q binomial, I would have had 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 over 4 factorial. Well, 1 sub Q is a 1, so you could cancel that. And the 5 actually cancels with a 5. So anyway, at the end of the day, you have to take this product of Q numbers divided by that product of Q numbers. You cross your fingers that this thing is actually not going to be a rational function, but really a polynomial in Q. It is. And it's even non-negative as a polynomial. Q, and it's this thing that goes, you know, 1 plus Q squared, it, it skips the Q to the first, and then it's got some coefficients of 2 here and here and here, 
skips the Q to the 11th. It's actually a symmetric polynomial in Q. And so before I do any uh, root of unity evaluations, there are going to be six roots of unity, since it's a cyclic group of order six. Let me take it mod Q to the six minus one. And that makes it a little easier to evaluate it. Also, I can look at these numbers. So here it is mod Q to the six minus one. So like that Q to the 12th and the two Q to the sixth, they become part of the Q to the zero coefficient. So the two and the one from there join with the one, and that's how I got a four here when I reduced it. Get these coefficients when I reduce. This four is the A zero. That's supposed to be the total number of orbits. One, two, three, four. Good. This one right here, the A one, was supposed to be the number of free orbits. One free orbit, and so on. That was three, and this two. It's a little more interesting here because we've got orbits whose isotropy group here is of size two. Here it's of size two, here it's of size three, and so these things are telling us about how many you know, have isotropy group dividing those powers. You can check those. But let's do the root of unity evaluations. So at Q equals one, no surprise, this whole thing turns back into this one over five, eight choose four, the Catalan number, yes. We knew that classically you know, for centuries, that that counts the triangulations. Everybody's fixed by the zero power. Q equals negative one, I plug it in, I get what, four plus three plus three is the even coefficients, minus one plus two plus one, and I get what, 10 minus four is six? Is that what, yeah. Six things that are fixed by uh, C cubed. C cubed is a 180 degree rotation, so there should be six things that are centrally symmetric. This and this. Everybody in this orbit and everybody in this orbit, they are fixed under a 180 degree rotation. Not these. Right? Those are fixed by 120, uh, yeah, 120 degree rotation, and not these. That's that six. What's this two? When I plug in Q equals zeta squared, that uh, has order three. That's like 120 degree rotation. And C squared, that fixes just these. Two of them is counting these. And when I plug in Q equals zeta to the one, that's C to the first. How many things are fixed by C? Nobody. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm hitting you over the head. I should go faster than this. Any, any questions so far? <coughs> yes, the interpretation of the diode You mean uh, extending it to the reflector? Yes. This is a great one. One of our frustrations is there are generally in these situations where we have good formulas, some way of evaluating to get the, the rotational powers in there. We also have some formula that lets us get the reflections. And you know, there's two conjugacy classes of reflections of N Z. Somehow we haven't been able to phrase like a coherent phrasing for every example. So I would say I'm not sure. I'd like to see a good phrasing. In this case, there definitely are some formulas. Okay, that's so again, advertisement. This is a theorem. But it's, you'll see later, I'm, I'm going to use the bad proof technique. And the bad proof technique, I'm going to tell you already, is you uh, evaluate these things at roots of unity, which is not hard, using L'Hopital's rule. And you evaluate those counts for the number of things fixed by combinatorics. You check that they're the same. Completely unenlightened. And that's the only way we have a proof of this seemingly you know, simple thing. This one is even more frustrating. Okay, so maybe some of you know some statistical physics, some uh, alternating sign matrices. So these are an interesting combinatorial object. They, they kind of came up from work of Mills, Robbins, and Runzee uh, in the 1980s. They first enumerated these strange objects that generalize permutation matrices. So n by n matrices with zeros and ones and a one in every row and every exactly one one. So for they, they look unmotivated when you first see them, but they had to do with something called the lambda determinant and the Dodson compensation formula for evaluating determinants. And they came up with a generalization of determinant in which the terms, instead of being indexed by permutations, were indexed by these objects, these alternating sign matrices. There were more terms. 
So what's an alternating sign matrix? It's an n by a matrix. Its entries are 0, 1, or negative 1. I'm going to show you the examples down here just so you have them in front of us. Uh, permutation matrices are always alternating sign matrices. So these are 3 by 3 permutation matrices. Here's one where I've got 1, 0, and negative 1. And what's the rule? The rows and the column sums are uh, plus 1. And the non-zero entries have to alternate in sign when you go along any row or column. You forget about the zeros, but when you see 1, minus 1, 1, as you encounter the plus 1s and the minus 1s, they should go plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. It has to sum to one, plus 1 at the end of any row or column, so you should be flanked by pluses on the, on the outside there, ignoring the zeros. And that should be true down rows and down columns. The definition. Okay. These are related, it turns out, to this thing called the square ice model in, in statistical physics. And so ultimately, the proof that this formula gives a Q analog, in other words, the, counter, the cardinality for this thing at Q equals 1, the proof that this formula is correct actually relied on formulas from physics, some uh, formulas of Zergen and Karepin. And Greg Cooperberg came up with a kind of an insightful proof. Doran Zeilberger had a sort of a nasty recursive proof, roughly, maybe Zalberger's was slightly earlier, but uh, I, I think the insightful proof is Cooperberg's that uses some statistical and ph physics interpretation in terms of square ice here. Okay, what am I going to take as my uh, cyclic action? It's a measly little four element rotation group. I take these matrices and I rotate them. 90 degrees. 180 degrees, 270 degrees, and they come in orbits. Look, here's the example for n equals 3. Oh, did I show you? Sorry, that formula went by a little quickly for the Q analog. It's a very strange thing. You take the product from k going from 0 to n minus 1 of 3k plus 1 factorial sub q, n plus k factorial sub q on the bottom. And this ratio, again, it turns out to be a polynomial in q with non-negative coefficients. We know that because it has some other interpretation in terms of counting certain partitions, certain kinds of plane partitions by weight. Nobody understands why that is true, actually. They don't have a bijection between these objects and those objects somehow keeping track of a Q weight. So just can prove that this also counts something else as a generating function. It's very strange. Okay. So let's see what happens when n equals 3. Uh, here is our orbit structure. So these are permutation matrices, and here's the other two permutation matrices. There's three factorial, six total permutation matrices. They break up into two orbits, uh, a free orbit under the rotation, an orbit whose isotropic group is size 2 under the rotation, and this is the only alternating sign matrix of size 3 that is not a permutation matrix. It's the only one you can write down. And this one is finally a fixed point. I might show you an example where you plug in the primitive fourth root of the unit and you actually do count something. And you write down this thing with the factorials, you know, so what was the pattern on the top? It was one factorial, four factorial, seven factorial in general. It skips by threes. 10, 13 factorial, 16 factorial. On the bottom, you start at n, so it's n is three, three factorial, four factorial, five factorial. And notice, uh, actually, if you wrote this out, the number of factors on the top would be 1 plus 4 plus 7, that's 12. On the bottom, it's going to have three, factor, sorry, 3 factors, and then 4 factors, and then 5 factors, 3 plus 4, 12. This always happens. You could check that you're going to have the same number of factors on top as on the bottom. In all these cases where there are product formulas, this occurs helps when we're doing the, the bad proofs, the L'Hopital evaluation. So anyway, some cancellation occurs, the four factorials go away, you get uh, seven factorial cancels with a lot of five factorial, leaving a seven times a six, you get some three times two on the bottom, you get some polynomials. You plug it in at q equals uh, one, q equals i squared, and q equals i to the first, and indeed, I reduced it my q to the fourth minus one, you get the coefficient of 3 here for the 
three orbits, one free orbit, right, there's the free orbit, and you get the correct evaluation, seven at Q equals one, at Q equals minus one, we're getting three, why should we get three? Uh, this, this, and this, these all have isotropy subgroup dividing three. And at Q equals I, which is our zeta the first, we get one, there is finite one, these fixed ones. Okay, so, yes? So, is it, a, is it clear that this determines the polynomial? <clears throat> I mean, is this the unique polynomial with these properties? Uh, so, th this part is, it completely determines. Yeah, that one is, but, yeah. no, 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 no. I mean, if I pile on properties, like saying, I wanted to have a product formula, I want the product to only have cyclotomic factors, it is entirely unclear how uniquely this determines the, such a polynomial. So, given your set, the set of matrices for those properties, yeah. how, how did you arrive at, could you just say more about how you arrived at the statistics that gives you that, it looks like you just pulled it out of the air. Absolutely. I'm sorry, I'm not understanding. Um, yeah, I, absolutely. How could that just appear? that polynomial. <laughs> so, as I say, Mills, Robbins, and Romsey actually counted these objects because they came up in these lambda determinants. They conjectured that this formula without the Qs, Q equals one, they conjectured counted these matrices. They didn't have a proof. And that hung around for years until Salberger and, and then uh, Cooperberg proved it. By that point, they already knew about this analog was counting these other things. I didn't say what they're called. They're called descending plane parts. It's totally mysterious. But this is what I'm saying. One nice thing is if you have such a nice product formula like this that does the evaluation, it's, it's better than having the uh, this kind of mysterious expansion here. You're not likely to find a good you know, small, uh, concise way of, of writing what that sequence of coefficients are when you've reduced it. But that product formula is very concise. It makes it, makes it extremely easy to actually evaluate it, these roots of unity. It kind of, it packages all that enumerative information in some tiny, small package. Um, do you have an existence theorem? So if I gave you the set, I gave you the group action, do you know there exists an X of Q with these properties describing the orbits? No, I, I can always write down this one. I just write down this guy where I, I cook up those coefficients. I let the AIs be the number of right. orbits. Who's, so I can cook up this bad one. I, I will be saying this on the next slide. But what we'll, we want is some, some nice looking one. And it's only in certain instances where we have enlightening proofs. So there's going to be some invariant theory that says yes. Let me, let me spoil that surprise. The group X has a transitive action of a reflection group. By here I mean a, a, yeah, a complex reflection group, a finite subgroup of GLNC generated by reflections. Then yes, I can tell you how to write down an insightful polynomial. Not, not this thing with the reduced coefficient, but something that makes sense that you would have wanted to calculate anyway. And I wish I had them in general. Yeah, so. Sometimes yes, and sometimes no. But you haven't classified the... the no, this is, this is part of what's mysterious for us. <coughs> Good question. Thanks. Other, other questions? So in this case, you don't have a statistic uh, satis describing this polynomial on, on the so set of alternative assignments. So there is this descending plane partitions counted by their weight. Yes, yes, for the, but not, not for alternative assignment yeah, matrices. Is you cannot uh, understand it from this. By the way, there's there's a wonderful book about that whole Mills, Robbins, Rome thing. It's called uh, Proofs and Confirmations by David Bursu. It's the Proofs and Confirmations, the alternating sign matrix story. And one of the mysteries you'll find in that book is this formula that counts descending plane partitions by weight at Q equals one counts alternating sign matrices and nobody knows of a statistic on alternating sign matrices that matches the descending plane partition story. Yeah, people are still trying to understand Actually, I do have another question. Yes. So, so if I know the orbit structure, I can write down the second polynomial. That's, right. Right. That's determined. This is determined. Right. 
Now, what is, have, have you said, and I apologize if I've missed that, have you said what the extra information is in the polynomial, in the original polynomial above? Only that it's concise. And it has some other desirable properties, right? It's a non-negative polynomial in Q. But this is an, ex and, it, and it has meaning in statistical physics, you know, uh, I should have I'm actually lying about that. No, it has meaning in plane partition theories, counting these descending plane partitions. No. Concise, it has some of the properties that I've had on that other slide. Like, I don't know of it counting points in a variety over FQ. I don't know of it as being an SL2 character. I don't know of a graded algebra for which it's the Hilbert series in this example. I feel like we don't yet understand this example very well at all. It's very intriguing. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Is, yeah, is like, there another way to produce Q analogs besides taking a formula that has numbers and factorials in it and putting little brackets and Qs on it? Well, I, you know, to count points over on a variety. Give me Betty numbers or something. You know, they, they come up. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Hilbert series, yes. That's my favorite way to Hilbert series. And in, in invariant, they, they naturally arise. Yeah, first variant. <laughs> So, um, yeah, uh, I think we should, before I reveal the bad proof technique, I mean, it's going to be so deflating anyway, we should take a break. So uh, why don't we take a 10 minute break and resume. Is that okay? <coughs> yeah, so, uh, Thanks for your questions and during the break. Thanks for the questions. I'm very happy to, to meet everybody. And uh, uh, I, including the antagonistic questions, I like too. Like I always have to ask, what what kind of formulas do you want? And the answer is, you see, you'll see some more examples, and um, uh, I'll, I'll try to explain. You know, what what do we like about this this phenomenon as we go along? Okay, so the these examples that I've shown you so far, they can all be proven by a bad technique. The first one will all be a good technique, but the last two, the triangulations, these alternating sign matrices, this quote bad technique is, is the only one that I know to, to prove it. And it's not so bad, it at least is, is quite effective. It works when you have one of these product formulas, as I was saying, you know, Q number, Q number, Q number in a numerator, Q number, Q number, Q number in the denominator. And notice, I've set it up so that there are L terms in the numerator, L terms in the denominator, they match up. This tends to be the, the situation where we can analyze this most easily by the bad technique. Okay, and just to show you the, the three examples that we looked at most recently, they're the only examples, they all have this property. When you do the N choose K, you get take K terms in the numerator and K factorial in the denominator after you do some cancellations and factorials. They, they do match up. In the Catalan example, the, the triangulations, is 2n choose n would have had uh, n terms in the numerator, n in the denominator, but you cancel this n plus 1 also with one of the terms from the numerator. You end up with n minus 1 terms in the numerator and the denominator. They match up. And that example that I was saying with the alternating sign matrices, it also has this property, you know, the 3 plus 4 plus 5 was equal to 1 plus 4 plus 7. That will always be true, you can check. There's n times 3n minus 1 over 2 factors, both in the numerator and denominator. And so what does the bad tech, oops, the bad technique tells us to do? I'm trying to show you that when I evaluate this polynomial at some d through the unity, sorry, at zeta to the d, where d, zeta was an n through the unity, so this, Zeta to the is just some n through the unity. Evaluate it via L'Hopital's rule, or something even easier. You really don't have to start taking limits in this situation, I'll show you. And so that lets you plug in the root of unity, count it, get a formula, and then count the number of things fixed by that power of C to the D directly. Hope that it's in the combinatorics literature, or hope that you can do it, or just hope that there's some way to get it. So this is very unsatisfying. But what you really hope for is that you can check that it's a theorem and that you'll get an insightful proof later as to why this product formula did the correct thing. And there are some situations that we'll be showing you where 
we definitely have such insightful proofs later. Okay, just to illustrate how this works roughly in, in our first example. Um, so here's kind of one of the crucial exercises that uh, you don't really need to use look at all. When you're looking at your zeta to the d, and zeta was an nth root of here, well, what really matters is what is its primitivity? It's a primitive capital D root of unity for some divisor, capital D of n. Right? So figure out what is the, its, its primitivity, what is its order, its multiplicative order. And then if you have a numerator factor, capital N sub Q, and a denominator factor, yeah, capital M sub Q, that are congruent mod that capital D, you know, plugging in a primitive capital D root of unity, these things, when the n and the m are congruent mod d, either give you a 1 or an n over n. In other words, either you can ignore them, or they give you a factor in your formula that you have to pay attention to. And what are the two cases? n and m are congruent mod d. If they're both congruent to 0, sorry, not congruent to 0, you can ignore them. They give you a 1 factor when you evaluate. And if they are both congruent to 0, they're both divisible by d, capital D, you actually get like n over d divided by m over d, which is n over m. So easy, easy exercise to do because we know what those n sub q are and the m sub q, it's just those geometric series. And so here, for example, is you know a handy thing for evaluating q binomial coefficients at these nth roots of unity. So you're trying to remember zeta is always a little nth root of unity. I'm taking a power of it. I find out what's the primitivity of that, that uh, root of unity, call that capital D. And when I want to evaluate n choose k at this root of unity, take n and divide it by capital D and find the remainder. So there's a quotient and a remainder. I'm calling that little n1 for the quotient, little n2 for the remainder in that range. Do the same for the k, the bottom of the, the binomial coefficient for q binomial. Quotient k1, remainder k2 when you divide by capital D. And then what you find is that this evaluation is the quotients n1 choose k1 give you an ordinary binomial coefficient. That's an integer right here. And then you just have to look at the remainders, the n choose, the n2 and the k2. You just have to evaluate remainders up to d minus 1 at the q equals zeta to the d. And you hope that in, in most situations, you're only going to have situations where these remainders are zeros or ones. So for example, we were assuming that uh, capital D is going to divide n in our setting. So this remainder n2 is always going to be 0 in, in the setting that we were looking at. Also, I should be using a, a convention. My binomial coefficients are equal to 0, and my q binomial coefficients are equal to 0 if the bottom number is bigger than the top. That's, that's the convention here. So it means many times these things vanish. And so, you use these, you know, kind of easy exercises for the root of unity evaluations, and let me show you what happens with the binomial coefficients. Okay, so again, I've got my q binomial coefficient. I'm evaluating it at uh, zeta and nth root of unity raised to the d. Here's what happens: if that primitivity, if the the order of zeta to the d divides the bottom of the q binomial coefficient, we knew that it divides the top. Right? We know that because zeta is a primitive nth root of unity, zeta the d has to be a primitive d root of unity, capital D root of unity for something dividing n. So if it divides the bottom of the binomial coefficient, you get n over d choose k over d, just using this, this previous exercise. And otherwise you get zero. Right? What happens when you're getting zero is that that root of unity, it divides more numerator factors than it divides denominators more zeros on the top than on the bottom. Not, not hard to check. So that's the root of unity side, the L'Hopital side. What about when I'm trying to count these k subsets of 1 through n that are fixed by c to the d? Okay, So I've done an example here where n is 15. I've arranged my numbers 1 through 15 around the circle. The cyclic action cycles them. 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3. So it kind of rotates the picture. How do I get a subset? I've circled a subset which is going to be fixed by some power 
of that cyclic generator. This one is fixed. I pick the little dd equals 6. So I pick c to the 6th. How do I get a subset that's fixed by c to the 6th? Well, I actually figure out what's the capital D here. Uh, c to the 6th has the same order as c cubed. It's a fifth root of, sorry, its uh, primitivity is, is uh, 5. And so zeta to the 6th, in other words, has the same order when we're working, uh, when zeta is e to the 2 pi i over 15, zeta to the 6th generates the same subgroup as zeta cubed. It's a primitive fifth root of unity, so the capital D is equal to 5. And the way you get this subset, which is the circled numbers here, which is invariant under the c to the 6th, or invariant under the c cubed, is you divide it up into five equal, equally spaced blocks, and you have to pick a, in this case, what did I take? k was equal to 10. I began with a 10 element subset of 15, but it's really the same as this two element subset of the numbers one through three, which are in the, the fundamental domain. Okay, I take my 15 divided by five, which is capital D, and it's completely determined by its restriction to one, two, three. And I have to have a two element subset of one, three, three. And I hope that that's the same as the answer that I got up here, namely, so I've just counted for you. How many 10 element subsets of 15 are going to be fixed by c to the sixth is three choose two. The reason that I got any of them at all is because the 10 was also divisible by capital D equals 5. If 10 had not been divisible by D equals 5, there wouldn't have been any. I couldn't have drawn such a symmetric picture with the circles. But when it is, I get 15 divided by 5 is 3, 10 divided by 5 is 2. And it's 3 choose 2, and that's the same as what happened up here. I would have gotten 15 divided by 5 is 3, <coughs> 10 divided by 5 is 2. So it's just some easy combinatorial analysis. And let me just say that whenever I'm using the bad proof, it's not much harder than this if I have a product formula. One other thing I want to note is I would much rather say, oh, the number of things fixed under these various rotations is encapsulated by that single product formula than writing down this crazy you know, two cases. In some of the other examples, you'll get a case structure which is more horrible. Yeah, it depends on what was the order of the element of your cyclic group. You don't even want to write down these formulas. So one thing that we like about finding uh, a cyclic setting phenomenon with a nice, concise product formula for our Q analog, or just a concise formula in general, is it just makes it easier to express what's happening. Things look ugly when you write down you know, how many things are fixed by the various powers. But you can just say, oh, you have the cyclic setting phenomenon for some good Q formula. It's, it's much more uh, concise. Okay, stop selling that. Ready for good proof technique, the one that we wish we had every time. So, the special case of cyclic sibling phenomena where we had Z mod 2 actions, not just, uh, not any old cyclic group actions, was already uh, noted by John Stembridge to occur in something called this Q equals negative 1 phenomenon. In the, so when you're talking about a two element group, what you're saying is Q equals one and Q equals negative one. The second root of unity both have meaning and the Q equals negative one evaluations are counting some elements fixed under an involutive symmetry, a symmetry of order two. And so he had uh, this method that he, he liked, he wished occurred more often and he was able to show it in a few cases. So we're gonna generalize his, his linear algebra paradigm to our situation. We're trying to show that the number of things fixed by c to the d is this root of unity evaluation. So we try to find some complex vector space v that has two properties. It's got basically two ways to compute some action, some trace. On the one hand, we'd like it to have a basis indexed by that combinatorial set x. You know, I'll call these basis elements e sub x, or little x runs through our set of capital x that's permuted by the cyclic group element, permuted by C. So, in other words, just the basis element C acting on EX goes to E sub C of X, where C was our action on the finite set X. And alternatively, at the same time, it has a different way of expressing it, so it's a graded vector space, 
And so the, the pieces, the direct sum ends, uh, B sub i, the i homogeneous piece, has C acting on B sub i as a scalar, zeta to the i, where zeta is an nth root of unity and is the size of the single group. So the point is, you've got another way of thinking about your, your vector space that diagonalizes the action of C. And it's a finite cyclic group acting, so if you diagonalize the action, it should act by powers. And so these are kind of like the C weight spaces you decompose it into. If the generator is acting on V sub i by zeta to the i, then any power, C to the d, is going to act on V sub i as zeta to the i to the d, zeta to the i d. Okay. All right, so then if this happens, you're done. You just compute in the two different ways, these two different requirements give you two ways to compute the trace of C to the d on that vector space. On the one hand, it's permuting a basis. So you just have to count how many basis elements are fixed, which is the number of elements of capital X that are fixed by C to the D, and so you get the cardinality of the fixed space, the fixed points of C to the D. On one side, that's one way of getting this trace. On the other hand, uh, we've diagonalized C to the D, VI was its say to the I eigenspace. And so we see how many times does it have uh, C to the D, well, sorry, it acts by zeta to the I to the D on the VI. So that's the eigenvalue, and it has it with this multiplicity on v to the i, and that's the same as zeta to the i to the d is the same as zeta to the d to the i, we're both equal to the zeta to the i d, and that's the same as just plugging in our, our polynomial. Oh, no, oh, I forgot to say it up here. Yeah. I don't just want to diagonalize the eigenspace, I want the dimensions of those graded pieces to be the Hilbert series for that graded vector space, and so that was, of course, important. The point is, in this setting, you've diagonalized it, and the zeta to the i eigenspace for C has a dimension equal to the coefficient of q to the i and the terms of q for q analog. So this calculation is just plugging in q equals zeta to the d in that x of e, if you were so lucky as to have this set up. So it's just, we're just asking for a lot here. Right? But occasionally it happens. Questions about what, what we like as an insightful. Okay. So, where I'm headed is that we do get this, these kinds of insightful proofs from invariant theory. Whoop. Nope. Springer, Springer's theorem on the regular elements in reflection groups, and I mean real reflection groups, complex reflection groups. I'm going to be working at the level of generality sometimes of complex reflection groups uh, definitely provides this in a, in a fairly general setup that I'm going to explain in the second lecture. This is essentially where we're headed with reflection groups in the second lecture in invariant theory, how this happens. And I'm going to want to explain a GLNFQ example. I'm going to need some positive characteristics, some modular invariant theory analogs of this Springer theory. So that's, that's why we were led to go with modular invariant theory direction. But I want to tell you about some other things that I won't be discussing too much. So there have been situations where that good basis permuted by the cyclic action has been shown to come from kajdan lustig bases of representations of various kinds, dual canonical bases, uh, these things called web bases, if people have seen this, for, uh, for example, in type A representation theory. Kuperberg's web bases, and uh, some techniques. Uh, Mike, this is what I was telling you about some invariant tensors and symplectic groups. So recently, there have been various uh, situations where people are looking at invariant tensors under diagonal actions, and they've used diagrammatic techniques. So there's a lot of representation there that could come into play here. And in particular, we've seen it. You know, evaluation at roots of unity is often an interesting thing to do in representation theory. It, it's subtle, but it's that interesting thing. So some of these results that I'm not going to talk about are by people like uh, Brendan Rhodes, uh, Bruce Fontaine and Joel Kamnitzer, uh, Bruce Westbury, and Mark Ruby and Bruce Westbury are responsible for some of these. Okay. Yeah, so I'm just repeating myself here. These last two, the triangulations example, 
the alternating sign matrices, I'd love to see a good technique. Homework. <laughs> So let's see what's going on with GLNFQ. This was the first example that for us really said, oh, yeah, we're really supposed to think of GLNFQ as being like the symmetric group, and you'll see later, really like a reflection group. I mean, this was known to people before, but it's kind of really convinced us. I'm going to do a GLNFQ analog of my subsets, Q analog. So you're going to suddenly find, oh my gosh, there's T variables running around here. I have to do this. I used that Q as a generating function variable before. Now I need that Q to be a finite field the size. I'm going to fix a prime power. Q is P to the M. I need another variable. I'm sorry about this. Suddenly my, my Q analogs are going to be polynomials X of T. Sorry. And also, I want to warn you, people have seen like the Garcia and Heyman QT analogs, Hagelin. That's not this kind of a T. The Q and the T are not symmetric. They're not playing symmetric roles in my story. They play a symmetric role in their world. T is going to be my generating function. Okay, so our proto example had X was the K subsets of 1 through N. X of Q is this N issues K sub Q. I want to write it like this for the moment. It'll make it clearer why what I'm doing in the moment is a GLNFQ analog. So I'm rewriting my Q binomial. I've just, you know, sort of re-expressed some of those geometric series. I've turned them around. I've introduced some Q powers. Okay. But this this will be a more convenient way to write it. And we had our N cycle inside the symmetric group. So I'm using this Fraktur SN for symmetric group. That's just because I need a lot of capital S's later, so I prefer to reserve capital S for other things. So this is the symmetric group. And now, GLNFQ analog for a fixed prime power Q, what I do is I, uh, instead of K subsets of N, I look at K subspaces, K dimensional FQ subspaces inside of FQ to the N. N dimensional vector space over FQ. And there are times when I want to think about that N dimensional subspace over FQ as really the finite field with Q to the N elements, so the degree N extension of FQ. We're going to need that identification, but we have to pick a basis to do it. We will here. So this is this finite Grassmannian. It's the FQ points in, uh, in this uh, Grassmannian of K planes and space. What's my X of T? It's some kind of T analog of this guy up here. My, I had an N sub Q, N, N choose K sub Q. Now I'm going to have an N choose K sub Q of T, QT. So the Q is a fixed prime power. What do I do? I write down 1 minus t to the q to the n minus q to the 0, right? See, this thing that was here, it migrated into the exponent. This q to the n minus q to the 1 is in the exponent on the t. q to the n minus q to the k minus 1 is now in the exponent on the t. This seems mysterious. I will explain later why this was the right thing to do to write down. It's the Hilbert series for some invariant ring. Let me not tell you which invariant ring it was the Hilbert series for, but we didn't just, you know, pull this out of thin air. And so that's my x of t. So it's not a hard exercise to check that as t goes to 1, this thing turns into this thing. At t equals 1, this is a t analog of that. So this is crazy. There's a q and a t. When t equals 1, I go back to my original thing, which was a q analog. Sorry about that. Now it's, it's a T analog. And where's my cyclic action coming from? OK, so these are K subspaces in FQ to the N. And you notice I said FQ to the N, but sometimes I'll say FQ to the N, right? We can identify those. That thing that I just confused you verbally, you can make such an identification, right? So you think of the, the Q to the N sized finite field as an FQ vector space of dimension n. And so GL, when I look at FQ linear maps on that Q to the n sized finite field, um, yeah, how do I say this? Let's try this again. Start over. The field whose size is FQ to the n, when I take the non zero elements in a finite field, it's cyclic. That's my cyclic group. It's a cyclic group whose size is ordered q to the n minus 1. 
I pick a generator for it. And I think of that thing as fq linearly multiplying the elements in that finite field, which is an n-dimensional vector space over fq. I've just picked some elements of gl on fq. In other words, I pick a basis for that degree n extension over the base field fq, and so then I can identify this cyclic group with a cyclic subgroup inside of GL and FQ. I mean, people in representation, you know, like the lean listing theory, this is this maximally non-split torus inside of GL and FQ. People have seen this, I don't know what you call it, maximal anisotropic torus or, or something. It's an obvious cyclic group of order Q to the n minus 1 that sits inside of GL and FQ. And it acts, therefore, on these subspaces, you know, every element of GLNFQ sends a k-dimensional subspace to another k-dimensional subspace in FQ to the n. And the claim is that this gives us a cyclic cyclic phenomenon. Okay. You want to know how many k-dimensional subspaces of FQ to, the, FQ to the n are fixed by a certain power of this generator of your cyclic group FQ to the n, but brought into GLNFQ. You just plug in a root of unity. So what are you plugging in? You're plugging in q to the n minus first roots of unity, complex q to the n minus first roots of unity in this expression, which is very easy to do, you know, using that cancellation trick that I was showing you. So this gives you a very concise way of, of encapsulating those numbers is to write this down instead of giving some sort of case-by-case -case formula. And we were led to this when we were looking around for examples we saw a paper in the Electronic Journal of Combinatorics by a guy named Drudge, uh, who he wrote down some kind of, you know, funny-looking formulas case by case for what happens, not using this thing, but how many subspaces were fixed by a singer cycle, what were the sizes of the orbits. He wrote down mildly ugly formulas, and we thought, hmm, you know, maybe there's some kind of cyclic sitting phenomenon going on here with these singer cycles, and there was, and. Uh, let's, let's just see you know, an example here. So, working over a field of order 2, uh, looking at the four-dimensional vector space over F2, and I'm going to look at two-dimensional subspaces. Okay, so that extension field has size 2 to the fourth, 16. I might realize it by adjoining uh, an alpha to F2 that satisfies this minimal polynomial, alpha to the fourth plus alpha plus one. And so there are 15 elements in this cyclic group, the non-zero elements of, of F16. They embed inside the, the uh, invertible four by four matrices over F2. And you know you can send a, a generator of that cyclic group uh, you can send it to one of these matrices whose, uh, this 4 by 4 matrix. So what is this? This is the companion matrix for an element in GLNF, GL4F2 whose minimal polynomial is x to the fourth plus x plus one. So you've got this subdiagonal ones and this one, one, zero, zero, what are the coefficients of that minimal polynomial? It turns out in this case, alpha itself actually generates the the non-zero elements in the finite field. It's a little bit subtle to pick a generator, but in this case, we could just pick the guy who we had adjoined. It turns out it's primitive that way. So I write down its companion matrix, and that will be a matrix over F2 that is one of these Singer cycles. This thing will have order 15. Okay, so it generates a cyclic subgroup of order 15. And so what I'm claiming is that if I want to know how many two-dimensional subspaces in F2 to the fourth, are preserved by maybe this guy cubed. I'm just picking some power. Okay. Well, I have to plug in in this QT binomial. I will always be taking the Q to equal two. Right. It's a fixed prime power. And uh, I'm going to be plugging in T is zeta cubed. Right, because I was asking how many things are fixed by C cubed. Zeta's going to be a 15th root of unity, q to the n minus 1 root of unity. And uh, so zeta cubed is a fifth root of unity. And so what I need to do is look at this 
this uh, x of t thing, you know, which had these 1 minus t to the q to the n minus q to the k kinds of things. Well, I write it down. It looks like 1 minus t to the 15th, 1 minus t to the 14th, 1 minus t cubed, 1 minus t squared. I'm plugging in this fifth root of unity. I use some of my L'Hopital exercises and say, like, oh, yeah, this actually is non-zero in this particular case. Uh, so these two terms actually give me the 15 over 3. They are both divisible by... Right, I'm, I'm worried about... Actually, it's opposite to what I was saying before, whether they're congruent mod... Uh, capital D is, is 3 in this case, right? Capital D is 3. Thank you. Capital D is 3. Okay. So these two are, have the same residue mod 3. Good. I've matched them up. These two have the same residue mod 3. These two have a residue mod 3, which is not 0. So I can ignore them. They become the 1. Whereas these two have the same residue mod 3, namely 0. So I take 15 divided by 3. Thank you, folks. So I get 5 for my answer. You know, it's reasonably easy to compute these using the, the fact that there's a, a phenomenon. And I'm going to sketch for you the bad proof. But later we'll see a good proof. The bad proof, this is kind of similar to what Drudge was doing. It's not so hard to mimic what we were doing with our rotating the subsets. What you have to do is, if you're given your c to the d in this cyclic group. So it's a multiplicative group of f to the n. So f to the n cross the non-zero elements. Just figure out what is the intermediate subfield between f q and f q to the n. What does it generate when you adjoin it? It's going to be some f q to the m. And the m will be a divisor of that. This is kind of like finding the capital D corresponding to your power of c. This is the analogous move. Once you know what that is, you use that same L'Hopital exercise and you check, oh, this n choose k sub q, when I set q to that prime power, when I set t to be a power of q to the n minus 1, the deep power of q to the n minus 1, I figure out what this little m is, and I'm going to get 0 unless the little m also divides k. It'll always divide n, as we saw. If m divides k, what you get is n over m, choose k over m, and now this is interesting evaluated at q to the m. Okay, so you, you take the, a q by, this was a qt binomial coefficient. We set t to a power of root, uh, a root of unity. Now we're getting one of these q binomial coefficients, but evaluated at our prime power when it's been elevated to q to the m. This is not a hard calculation with the, the local tall trace. And meanwhile, you compare it to the thing which is the analog that picture with the, the, row, the symmetric subset going around the circle. The analog of that calculation says, how do you have a k-dimensional subspace, fq subspace inside here, preserved by c to the d? Well, it has to be a, a subspace over this larger field, right? If this element c to the d in the field extension takes it back into itself, it's stable under multiplication by c to the d. It's stable under the entire subfield is generated by C to the D. It's really an FQ to the M subspace, not just an FQ subspace. That's, that's exactly what it has to be. So you have to count how many, and notice it won't be a k-dimensional subspace over FQ to the M, it'll be a k over M dimensional subspace of FQ to the M, if it was stable. So you have to count how many k over M dimensional FQ to the M subspaces are there inside FQ to the M. Well, it's one of these Q binomial coefficients evaluated at Q to the M. And it only happens when K divides M. And it's, this is the same answer as what we got for the root of unity evaluations. This is the, the uninsightful proof. You, just to see how we get that 5 again. What am I saying? I'm saying 4 choose 2, uh, that 5 that we got from before, <coughs> you could think of it as this Q, Q binomial Qt binomial, 4 choose 2. I'm evaluating it, Q equals 2, and uh, T is the zeta cubed. I'm actually going to get uh, a 
4 over 2, choose 2 over 1. Choose 2 over 2, that's a typo. Sorry. 2 choose 1, but now it's at base Q squared. The point was C cubed generated this intermediate subfield between F2 and F2 to the fourth, it generates an F2 squared. Just check. And so this is going to be on base Q squared. So you set the, the Q in your uh, 2 to uh, another typo. This is, should be a 1 plus Q. Oh, this is terrible. My 2 sub Q, I have to evaluate it at. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. This, this is OK. This is 1 plus Q squared. I'm evaluating it at Q squared equals 4, Q equals 2, and you get 5. So it's, it's the same calculation, but I'm just showing you what happens here, how we got that 5. OK, so I believe there are no more pages here. Uh, my point is, you should not be happy with the bad proofs. I'm going to show you this. This was our first example where the, the variant theory method, this particular theorem, where it, it worked extremely well once we got the invariant theory on our side. And I'm afraid we really need to understand more about the analogy between the symmetric group and GLNFQ and reflection groups and GLNFQ and 